All right. So welcome. I am Julie Moody Freeman. Welcome to the first event in our three-part online series on African Black Diaspora Romance. African and Black Diaspora Romance. Um, I'm Julie Moody Freeman, the director of the Center for Black Diaspora. And the series was um, co-organized by Amy Burge, who is from the Center for Contemporary Literature and Culture at the University of Birmingham. Uh, Eric Selinger, who is at DePaul University, but also the president of the International Association for the Study of Popular Romance, and myself from the Center for Black Diaspora at DePaul University. I want to give a big shout out to all of our viewers who have Zoomed in uh, to be with us. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to acknowledge the staff who I could never have done this without. So um, Joel Daly, the Assistant Director of the Center for Black Diaspora, uh, Catherine Douglas, the Center's Administrative Assistant, Jessica Williams and Jennifer Ogumiki, who are our student researchers and coordinators. Thanks so much. A quick note before we jump in, I just want you to know that again, this is the first round table series, but we have a second round table series, which will be on Black British Romance, October 20th, 10.30 uh, a.m. Central Standard Time, 11.30 Eastern, 4.30 p.m. UK. We'll drop that link in the chat for you soon. Um, the third is on Black Romance in Africa in November. And as soon as we get that information, we'll tweet it out, send out emails. So here's a little outline of the program. Um, I'll briefly introduce Margot Hendricks, who will take over. She is our moderator. The chat is open, so you can send questions and we'll gather them up and you'll have time to ask those questions. Uh, we have an hour for conversation. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for, um, for questions from the audience. And the event will end at 2.30 Central Standard Time. All right. So um, I want to introduce Margot Hendricks. Um, Margot Hendricks writes romance as Elizabeth Grace. Her most recent novels appear in the Daughter of Saria series. She's the author of numerous academic publications on race, gender, and class in Renaissance and early modern English literature. And she has essays on Black romance forthcoming in Black Love Matters, edited by Jessica Pride, which is forthcoming in 2022, February 2022. That will be in the chat. And the Journal of Popular Romance Studies, that will also be in the chat. Um, as well as a forthcoming academic book, Race and Romance, Coloring the Past. I want to welcome Margot Hendricks and all of our special panelists today. Thank you. Turning it over to you, Margot. I always forget to unmute myself. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, the idea behind this roundtable is um, to have conversations about black romance. Introductions are by their nature signposts, signposts that guide readers, provide informational cadences and justify what falls between page one and page conclusion. Introductions of panelists serve the same purpose and more so. In an essay I wrote about Beverly Jenkins Indigo, and for those of you who follow me on Twitter, you know I'm all about Hester and Galen, all about the couple. I wrote, it is Hester and Galen who are the black people who love, who prove that while black lives may be affected by the constraints of a white supremacist political economy, black love is. Today's round table centers black love, black and African diasporic cultures in all its iterations. Today, this round table centers a black gaze on black romance. Our panelist, Piper G. Hewley is a two-time RWA Golden Heart finalist. She is the author of Migrations of the Heart, a three book series of historical romances set in the 20th century featuring African-American characters Piper is also the author of the Home to Milford College series. The series follows the building of a fictitious college from its founding in 1866. 
the contemporary romance portion of this series, Sweet Tea, which is a fabulous book, was published by Hallmark Publishing this July, 2021. Piper's debut historical novel about Anne Lowe, the black designer of Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress will release June 7th, 2022 with William Morrow. Katrina Jackson is the self-published author of Erotica, Erotic Romance, and historical fiction with lots of black love, queer characters, and racially diverse casts. She writes high heat, emotional stories, and believes that it's time for a 70s disco to make a resurgence, and I'm all for that. Tatiana, Tati Matthews Richardson is a fiction writer, podcaster, and sometimes blogger from the east side of Atlanta, Georgia. It was a trip to the library at age 13 with her mother that she discovered the world of romance in old, well-worn copies of Beverly Jenkins historical romances. In December of 2019, Tati started the podcast Romance and Color with Dr. Yakini Etheridge, who is unable to be here today because of illness. Um, and initially, it was a place to talk all things Hallmark and holiday movies. Romance and Color has evolved, however, into a podcast dedicated to the discussion of the intersection of race and romance in movies, television, books, and all facets of pop culture. Currently, Tati is in the pre-submission stage of her first completed manuscript, A Romantic Comedy. Lotoya C. Smith is an award-winning editor and literary agent. She has been featured in Publishers Weekly, Forbes Magazine, and USA Today, as well as being on various author, book conference, and book blogger websites. Lotoya provides editorial and consultation services for her company, LCS Literary Services. She is also the co-founder of Art House Literary Agency, where she offers literary representation. Okay, that's the formal part. Now the informal part. This is the part you came for, okay? Because we're gonna have a conversation and you know, when black people get together and have conversations, we have fun. So what did Julie and I do? We came up with three topics we asked our presenters to just reflect on and talk about. The first one, which um, I don't know why we did this to you, but we did. We asked them for definition, their definitions of black romance. The second idea we came up with, asked them to focus on romance tropes, HEA, HFN, love, and other romance elements. And finally, and I think this is the one that is most critical for the romance community, romance scholarship, and romance authorship. And that is, what is the future of Black romance? We will spend an hour in conversation. I'm going to ask each panelist, I'm going to go alphabetically. So Piper, we're going to start with you and, and go through rounds. I'll reverse it. <laughs> um, <laughs> to just give us, you know, about five minutes of their thoughts on, you know, sort of each uh, of the topics. Um, and if you don't use five minutes, that's fine. Um, I'll be the time keeper but I want everyone to be able to say something about these topics individually so that we have, we're, we have the ability to have a conversation. Um, and then we're gonna leave about 20 to 25 minutes um, for Q and A's. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. If you have statements, you can put them in the chat and people can read them. I won't be reading statements. I will be reading questions. Okay. Um, so Piper, a definition of Black romance. Well, to start off with, um, Black romance uh, is a romance that features uh, Black protagonists. So I think that in uh, that community that um, is known uh, as Romance Landia, that I think that is the most difficult aspect to pin down. Uh, and I would say, is also authored by a black author or author. So um, that's what that's what it is. Um, so for instance, my uh, newest novel, Sweet Tea, does not fit that definition because there is a white male hero in that story. 
um, my previous work um, in the Hunts Milford College series and um, the, uh, home, uh, the Migrations of the Heart series were purposefully constructed uh, in order to meet this particular definition of, um, well, in this case, uh, a Black um, hero and a, and a Black heroine um, authored by me in historical settings. Um, so that for me is the, the crux of the definition uh, of it. And um, yeah, I, I guess that's what I would have to say. Black protagonist, Black author, um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Katrina. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to Piper's definition, um, except to say that I do think, well, I would absolutely agree with her that community called Romance Landia um, that has been very difficult, a very difficult definition to for people to accept and respect. And I think that is really important to note. Um, and I would argue that in other communities of romance authors, in particular indie romance authors, that is not, uh, that hesitance is not necessarily as, um, as clear or there's a much more understanding um, uh, audience for that definition. Tati, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, just to build upon what um, our previous panelists have said, um, not only does Black romance feature Black protagonists, but it also centers the Black experience, I think. And that can be broad. I mean, um, a lot of people kind of thumb their noses at what they consider urban or what they consider quote unquote blue collar romance, but that's also a part of our black experience as well, as well as the billionaires and the, you know, the, the white collar type of romances as well. But I think black romance is uh, diasporically diverse in his experience. So that's what I think black romance is in addition to having the black protagonist. It has to be diverse in its experience of what blackness is. Okay. Latoya, any thoughts you want to add? Yeah, definitely. Um, of course, everything everyone else said, um, I think also highlighting Black culture, whether it is from an African diaspora or Southern Black culture, I love. Um, also, I think that for a long time, Black romance was pigeonholed into like contemporary, you know, you wouldn't really see too much um, romance and sci-fi fantasy, historical. Um, there were some romantic suspense, but you really only had a few. Um, and I know when I was an acquisitions editor, that was a big issue. It was like, okay, you only can acquire this type of Black romance as if Black people don't fall in love in all settings. Um, so I think, you know, any subgenre where the focus is the couple and you have, yes, two Black characters, from the Black perspective, not just culture, but dialogue is really important, I think, in our experiences as well, you know, um, and yeah, highlighting the experience. So I definitely think, um, you know, across subgenres, we shouldn't be pigeonholed to just kind of contemporary settings. I think, you know, we could tell Black stories and romance stories from every, you know, subgenres perspective. Okay. I'm going to throw out general questions in between. Um, why do you think it's so? Okay, I swear a lot. So I, when I pause, the F-bomb is being contained inside me to emerge later. Why do you, all of you think it is so difficult for publishing, readership, and elements of Romance Landia to get the message. And here I'm asking you to speculate. Um, but it's said, it has been said repeatedly, especially over the last year, here's what's involved. So if someone says, please wreck black, a Black romance for me, a new to me Black romance. Um, we see familiar names. Why do you think it is so hard for that message to get through? Um, can I jump in here? Uh, Absolutely. I feel like 
Uh, when I was an acquisitions editor, one of the biggest challenges is just that sales and marketing um, usually did not, were not diverse. So I think that a lot of publishers were excited about getting black authors, but then you had no black staff that were working on these books. So they were either misedited, you know, because a white editor or other editor changed some of the cultural stuff, right? Then you have sales and marketing teams that have no clue that it really is a great contemporary romance, a great romantic suspense, a great whatever it is, and you market that as you would every other romantic suspense or paranormal, et cetera. However, it should be an added bonus that you would go to black you know, resources and media to sort of add that marketing element. So I think we were always looked at as separate, right? Like you have to do all this strategizing and all this like extra stuff. When I think now we're learning, we have more in common than we thought. And sometimes if you do what you know and just add a little bit extra flavor, I think you can make something work, but I think you need the team to actually care about it and not just do it to fill a quota, but actually hire people who have experience with some of these organizations who have a passion for it. Because something that I've learned is that, you know, no matter black, white, purple, if the sales and marketing team is not behind that book, it is not going to do well. So you have to first start with the editor. Yes, they have to be kind of that in-house voice. So if you don't have editors of color, you kind of get lost in the sauce. And then from there, it's like a domino effect. And I think, you know, something that has happened in the recent year or so, people are actually starting to care and they're hiring the staff necessary to take the book from submission to final book and really give it the effort and marketing dollars that they deserve just like every other you know, book on that list. I'd like to ask Tati as a blogger, reviewer, podcast um, mm -hmm. person, if you have thoughts about this coming from that spectrum. And again, thinking about what gets recommended. And I raised the question, I'm on Twitter mostly. Um, yeah. And what gets raised and wrecked as black romance and within 30 seconds of someone saying, and how often someone will say, I want a black romance wreck to me and people will ignore that. So as a blogger reviewer, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on, on either a willfulness or a sense of what gets circulated as black romance in the general public? Um, I think what generally is circulated as Black romance, I think there are like kind of two, um, two kind of houses of what's getting circulated as Black romance. So you have people who are kind of naming kind of the, the quote unquote big names in romance that are being popularized, that are being on the, you know, the Today Show and things like that, um, who necessarily, I don't feel, always write Black romance. But, you know, because to be quite honest, um, if you took anything Black out of the story, it would just be, a, I mean, you wouldn't know if the, the characters were Black or not. Um, and then you have kind of a camp of folks who are pushing um, wonderful romances by independent um, authors um, to the forefront who are like, hey, these are some people that need um, recognizing, that need to be, you know, highlighted as Black romance who are doing wonderful work, who have, you know, Black protagonists. But again, as Latoya said, they're, you know, because they're independent, maybe the marketing is all on them and they, they're, they aren't able to get their story out there to like a mass audience. So, um, for example, on like the book talks as like book TikTok or whatever, you start seeing the same people over and over again being recycled as Black romance when there's like a pocket of folks they're independent wise um, that they're not even looking at because people are just kind of hiding them marketing wise and it's just difficult to get the word out so I think it's up to folks like me who are podcasters and bloggers to let folks know hey you know yeah you're reading this person they're popular that's nice but have you if you like this person have you thought about this person you know um, to kind of bring them to the forefront um, and so I think it's just, it just becomes in here increasingly frustrating 
as a podcaster, as a reviewer, to try to get somebody to read somebody outside of what's popular because they're like, well, if it's not a New York Times bestseller, am I going to be interested? Those lists are problematic in itself. So we have to acknowledge that. And at the same time, you need to go for what interests you and what interests you may be outside of what's popular um, and what's outside of being what's pushed by the popular bloggers and tiktokers because those popular tiktokers and bloggers have their own agenda too they want to get paid they want to get the views um so they're going to push what's popular and what's out there but at the same time i don't that's not my concern my concern is quality literature my concern is putting things and people um on to folks that they may have never heard of and so um, it's about your agenda and what you want to kind of like push out there. So I think that's the frustration, those kind of two camps that are kind of at war with each other when they don't really need to be. I hope that makes sense. It does. Piper and Nicole, if you'll unmute yourselves, I will let you weigh in as authors who um, write in the, as well in Piper's case, traditional. Um, maybe you have some thoughts about the topic. Well, you said for a very long time, I was on the outside. I made some agents run away uh, from me, so literally. I was pitching ideas to an agent and she had the cards in her hand and she put the cards in her purse and moved away from me most expediently. So <laughs> I have not always been <laughs> embraced by anybody. Um, Part of my thought has to do with the fact that romance is widely accepted means fantasy. And part of the fantasy, and I'm thinking mostly um, here in the good old US of A, means ensuring that the couple, by the when they, but part of the HEA is ensuring that the couple is more than financially stable in the rest of their lives. And these editors, if, they're, if we're talking about traditional publishing, marketing teams, et cetera, do not see black male heroes as meeting that particular definition of gay capitalism, right? Yay, lots and lots of money, and uh, that stable aspect. Part of the fantasy is not um, allowing for, I saw someone in the chat, I'm a yay, blue collar romances. There are lots of very nice blue collar romances. Uh, there are black romance written by my friend Sharon Cooper, uh, for instance. Um, but when she writes for traditional, they don't want that. They don't want to see. Uh, construction heroes and stuff. Great stories that she pulled on uh, as she herself was in construction and witnessed, were witness to this in real life. So those two things um, working in concert, the sort of the, um, the stereotypical perspective that white people who are working in publishing have means, I think, and readers too, don't allow for more embrace of um, Black romance that features Black romance. Um, Nicole? Yeah, so I absolutely um, want to echo what Piper said here, and I've heard her say it before, and I don't think it can be said enough. The way that, um, in particular, traditional publishing treats Black heroes is a problem. Um, and so I think in answer to your question, I have many thoughts, but I think one of them is simply um, that, and people are sort of beating around the bush in this, or at least it sounds like it to me, but I just do not think that this is a space in traditional, in, in some parts of pockets of indie, this is not a space that gives a shit about black people, straight up. And so um, I think it is really significant that as romance has become quote unquote more diverse in the past like five to six years in particular, especially in traditional publishing, that has meant a woman of color heroine with usually a white hero. And um, especially thinking about what Piper said in terms of romance as the fantasy, right? Sort of part of the narrative there um, is that the white hero in particular will save the woman of color. 
and black men as not having historical access to finances cannot save you know black women let alone really anyone else right um, or that is the assumption and so when you think about in particular how largely cis women of color have leveraged their position in the field um just sort of leaving in particular black men behind. I think, uh, you know, it's really easy to sort of say it is someone else, but it is not someone else, right? It is coming from inside the house. Um, so I think that's part of the problem. Um, I also just think too, um, that readers, even black readers do not, um, or shy away from certain kinds of black love. Um, I am a historian by training. And I study, um, I mean, I'm a post-World War II historian, but I, I teach about uh, the full uh, range of Black history. So I teach about enslaved Black people. And no matter when, <laughs> including just recently, I could be talking about sort of the need for more Black historical romance. And the conversation is always, I don't want to read about slavery. Who cares what you want to read? Not, to, I mean, I'm joking, but like, but it is so frustrating to be a person happily descended from enslaved people who know that I am here because enslaved people loved one another. To then see readers who are asking um, ostensibly for more black romance, but to ignore this really vital and originary moment in um, not just the example of black love, but the resilience of black people. I have so many thoughts and I'm saving them. Because uh, everything that everyone has said has spoke to a fundamental question or issue. And that is, well, I'm gonna say it in two ways and, and it's gonna kind of lead to our next point which has to do with romance tropes, et cetera, but specifically because Piper brought it up, the HEA and the idea that black people either don't deserve an HEA within the context of black love, that the only way a black person can have an HEA is an interracial relationship. Uh, there's that trajectory, but then there's the other, that Beverly Jenkins in the Black podcast, um, Black Romance podcast said, people want to read Black trauma porn. You know, that if it isn't traumatic, if we don't hate ourselves because we are descendants of these, if we don't dislike seeing degrees of suffering before any um, true love is represented, it, it's not a black experience. So I'm going to ask you, and I'm gonna start with the authors first, um, to maybe comment on, on the complexity of dealing with romance tropes and romance conventions with respect to black love. Um. It depends on the trope. There's so many of them. So, um, but the whole aspect is, um, what, the, what the difficulty is, is seeing the trope play out with um, a Black hero and heroine in a way that really reflects that Black culture and that Black life. That a lot of readers are not prepared to see or wish to see. Okay, like for instance, one of the aspects of my Black historical where I took a little stripe was um, the need to have the hero be protective of the heroine. What does that look like for a Black man to be protective of a Black woman in a time period that widely assumed in terms of the history is going to be just purely awful for uh, the, the, this black couple. 
um, in Preacher's Promise, which is the first book in my Holmes Milford College series, where Virgil very explicitly schools Amanda about how to behave in the shop with the storekeeper, um, not her northern self, but in another way that requires her to sublimate her tendencies as a free Black woman to not show out or whatever. And I took stripe for that. But people wrote me about, well, he sucks and what kind of hero is he and all this other kind of stuff in terms of uh, the drugs. So there's that whole aspect about, uh, and some of those were other Black people who said that. We don't want to, see, you know, don't want to see this Black man being weak. He's not alpha, all of that other kind of stuff um, that uh, people had to say about that. When he was protecting her in that circumstance in 1866 Georgia, this is what you do, but people were not prepared to see it. So there is something in terms of the tropes and how they work in Black romance or how they would really work in Black romance that even Black people are not prepared to see. Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I don't, I don't understand or care about tropes. I, I'm not a trope reader and I'm not a trope first writer. Um, I usually figure out what trope I wrote when I finish the book. Um, I will say though, um, Part of why that's not a thing I'm particularly interested in, or a skill I'm particularly interested in developing is because I think um, what matters to me is that I craft a story that makes sense for my black characters. And sometimes the trope can be an impediment for that, which I, I think is absolutely what Piper's saying. Um, and so I would rather, um, as Margo said, as you, uh, as you said at the beginning of the panel, I would rather write the story from the standpoint of the black characters for a black audience and with the black gaze. And if the trope isn't readily apparent or if the trope isn't sort of stepping kind of full force into the story, maybe it's because it, it doesn't need to be there or I don't want to write it in a way um, where I have to um, sort of subvert it. Which is it to say though that there aren't art authors who can absolutely do that. I think Beverly Jenkins is like the, as someone said in the chat, like the best example of um, in particular, Black historical author, Alyssa Cole does this as well, who literally just sort of takes a trope and sort of turns it on, it on its hand, which you can do, but not everyone can or wants to do that. So I think it also depends, at least for me, on sort of understanding not just the kind of writer you are and want to be, but like the story you want to tell. And so I sort of push trope aside for um, a more clear focus on the sort of cultural and communal aspects that matter to me. We before I um, uh, move to Latoya and Tati on this same topic, I, I forgot an important term um, that I want authors to maybe comment on. So if you guys want to think about it and come back or make a quick response. And it has to do with, okay, I'm an academic, I'm a literature person, rhetoric. And rhetoric is literally the language that you use to tell a story, the way in which you craft a story through language, not necessarily through certain kinds of conventions, but the way in which the narrative unfolds in a skillful use of language. And, and that's gonna be the simplest. And any rhetoricians out there just don't come after me um, right now. But to think about the language that you use to craft this, because we tend to center on tropes when we're talking about romance, as if a trope is an understood and static phenomenon, rather than thinking about it in terms of language. So if you wanted to maybe comment on rhetoric, no, <laughs> on the language now, uh, Piper. No, I, I mean, I only look through the idea in terms of unless you're talking about dialogue and stuff, which is a whole other thing in terms of that, um, particularly, um, like I said, historically speaking, um, with my characters, that was a whole other um, argument to enter into. How should they speak? How should they speak in order to look and to present themselves in a certain way that is pleasing? 
to a romance reader. I, you know, all of that other kind of stuff. But yeah, of course, that's it. <laughs> all right, uh, Tati or Latoya, do you have any thoughts on the issue of romance conventions? Um. Okay, so let's see. I, I was scribbling down notes because I didn't want to lose my thoughts. So, so um, the first thing you mentioned was rhetoric um, and kind of rules and whether or not you can break the rules. And I, you know, having edited and worked on so many different genres from so many different authors, what I will say is you can break any rule you want if you do it right. Um, and so I don't think there's any rule per se you know, to writing, whether it's perspective, um, switching point of view, um, how many characters you hear from, et cetera. I think it's all about the storytelling and that'll jump me into tropes, which is, you know, I think if there are certain tropes that pop up in your story, I'm kind of of the belief with Nicole, like you write your best story and whatever jumps out, like understand how to define that once you have your thing. But I don't think you should allow trends and tropes to define what you write. I think you should absolutely write your best story and then when it comes time to pitch it, whether you're self-publishing or trying to find a publisher, you absolutely need not uh, work in a bubble. You need to understand what is happening around you in both the Indian traditional space and figure out how you will connect with your audience. And I think this is even true for traditional authors. I think back when I first got into publishing, you know, the publisher did so much more to help you figure out how to fit in and how to promote and market. And the author just wrote the book and kind of did their thing. Now that is not the case. You kind of have to really be hands on, figure out your market, connect with your audience and kind of supplement whatever it is that your publisher is doing. And then of course, if you're indie, you will be doing all of that. But I think that's something that a lot of authors in general, I think miss is that writing a great book is only a fraction of selling that book. And so you can write your best book possible, but if you don't know how to connect with your audience and you haven't partnered with the right publisher or publicist to help you connect with your audience, your book gets lost, you know? So how do you do that? And I think it's understanding the marketplace, not just looking at Amazon bestseller lists, but looking at Barnes and Noble and other bestseller lists so that you understand what is happening in the world around you and you recognize how to connect. Um, when it comes to your audience and connecting, I think the issue with publishers is that sometimes the black reader is not everywhere the white reader is. So for example, a lot of folks I know share books and they get them from the library. But if your publisher is not actively seeking those librarians and getting those copies, there are a lot of books that I've requested through my library to make sure that they have them. And I noticed kind of joining in Brooklyn Library versus Wake Forest, North Carolina Library, the book, there's way more black books in the Brooklyn Library than there is the North Carolina Library. So what do we do about that? Because there are some readers that might not be able to afford a $25 book. So why, you know, how can they have access to it? So, and that comes with editor experience, right? Because you're going to talk to the sales people and say, maybe we shouldn't do this book in trade original. Maybe we should do it in ebook original. Maybe we should do it in mass market original and play around with those price points to find that audience. And I think that's why so many more indie books do better, right? Because the authors can price pulse and do whatever they want, where the publishers have this like, strict system, you know, of how they price things and promote things. And a lot of times by the time they circle back and do the low price promotion, do the book bugs, you've kind of missed your opportunity. So I think it, it is a combination of things. You want to have that great book, right? But you also have to understand the book business and how do you translate your excitement and your characters and get that into the hands of your readers, whether you're with a publisher or not. And I think that is a piece of it that authors don't always think about. They get caught up with the craft of writing and then they don't quite recognize like, how do we go about connecting with our readers and getting that support on the back end to kind of keep us published, to keep our stories out there. Um, so. Thank you, Tati. Um, I don't know how, how much more I can add to the, to the conversation, but everybody's kind of touched on some of the things that I've thought about, um, but just very quickly about tropes itself, um, themselves rather. Um, 
I think tropes are a great starting point to get you interested in a story, particularly as a reader. Um, and I think any trope can be made fresh and new if you have a different cultural perspective on it. And as Black people, I know that we do have different cultural perspectives on things um, that are just wide ranging. Um, but at the same time, I do feel that certain tropes, even though people may argue with me, I do feel certain tropes just may not translate the same mm -hmm. for a Black audience as others. For example, everybody who knows me, and I've said this 3,000 times on my podcast, I will not read Secret Baby. Okay? I'm not going to read it. I don't like it. <laughs> and because <laughs> and because of how many stories have we seen in the media about break babies and all this other foolishness? Like, some stuff just doesn't translate well to me. Some stuff may be traumatizing to certain audiences. Kidnap plots, which are very taboo now. and People don't like those things. Um, those things can be very traumatizing to Black experiences. And we don't think about what our Black lived experiences are like bef oftentimes when they try to advertise tropes to us. So I think every trope is not for us. And that's OK. That's OK. Work in the tropes that you know will resonate with our community, period. Um, can I just add something? I also sure. think that, um, that, you know, for each author, you know, write, like I said, write your best book. And I think that, you know, you'll find that audience. There are people who may like fetish stuff and they might like kidnapping. There are people who may want to read about the enslaved experience. And there might be people who want to kind of jump to the new experience of, you know, upper middle class Black folks, billionaire Black folks. So I think the point is that for so long, we didn't have the leisure of writing a variety of things. We were only pigeonholed to this one story, this one type of cover, this one publisher only that will give you a shot. And I think, um, you know, going forward, we definitely want to, you know, have a space for all these different kinds of stories for all the readers that want them and to recognize that we deserve that space and that we have the talent to write our own stories, not someone else writing about us in these different spaces that we're not, you know, traditionally in or not allowed to write about. Thank you. Um, well, this kind of leads to the last point that we, um, that Julie and I sort of framed for the panelists, which has to do with the future of Black romance. Um, I'm going to, I've been really thinking about everything that everyone's saying. And so some of it, just so you know, will feed into the class that I'm doing tomorrow. But one of the things, okay. I'm a historical romance person. And when I say historical romance, I mean anything before the 20th century, and I'm not talking Regency and Victorian, even though that's how I fell into it. Um, honestly, the only historical romances that I truly read right now are primarily anything that um, Beverly Jenkins puts out. I've read everything that Piper has done, and I'm constantly begging people to recognize that Black people have been on this fucking planet since its inception and that we are not bound. Oh, someone just said amen because <laughs> I dropped the word. Um, that's the only one you're gonna get today. Um, that our histories are much more complicated. I am a 16th and 17th century English literature specialist. I write about Black people in this period and about race in this period, et cetera. And so I'm an advocate for us thinking outside the box, but also that we don't need to recreate a, um, a history, but we also need to understand that Black people lived within this history. And so I guess I will want to, and I asked the, the third topic is the future of Black romance. But I think I'd wanna ask you to think about the ways in which and if you, you don't have to explore this, but the ways in which the past in, should inform um, or ought to inform, can inform 
or push us towards a future of Black romance, if that makes sense. That is, sometimes we think about the here and now and that this is the Black experience, this is where we go forward, but there's a whole history involved in Black romance that people have been writing about and maybe not calling it romance, but they've been writing about it. And so I wonder, I'm not framing this right because it's coming off the top of my head, but I'm wondering if there is a way for you as readers, as literary agents, as Black romance authors to reflect on the intersection of romance in terms of Blackness, in terms of Black characterizations, in terms of Black stories, in terms of history, in terms of the present, in terms of the future. It's probably the easiest way for me to say that. And it's probably far too complicated for the next 15 or 20 minutes that we have, but I'm gonna let you guys have the floor. If, if I can say one of the things, um, I think I have two, uh, two answers. One is a scholar and one is a writer. And I think as a scholar, I'm, um, it has not surprised or it is not shocking, maybe it is shocking that there's actually, there are much, there are fewer black authors writing black historical romance right now than there actually used to be, which is very wild to say, considering that that has never been a really large population of authors period. Um, and I mean, I ask this question constantly on Twitter and I will continue to ask it, but the fact that no one has looked for the next Beverly Jenkins makes no sense to me. Like there has been no cultivation of a black historical author um, to replace her when she passes in 90 years. And so um, I think that that tells us a lot about that. And then um, as an author, I think one of the things I'm really interested in seeing more of in the Black romance space, and I'm an African um, diaspora scholar, I'm interested in seeing in any subgenre um, people across the diaspora meeting one another. And it has really been shocking to me how little of that actually exists. Uh, there's a lot of siloing of Black people in different continental spaces which certainly in the contemporary moment, but even in the historical moment, as many of you know, Black people have met one another from different um, ethnicities, different um, uh, geographic spaces, and they have done so in really interesting moments. Again, as a historian, look, I 20th century history is history, Margo, we will just write about it. But like, um, I mean, I just cannot fathom that there is not, for instance, like a civil rights uh, historical romance, like looking at like African-Americans traveling around with it. I mean, that is just, they're just, so many spaces or even just the number of civil rights activists who are from the Caribbean. I mean, there's just a lot happening there. And yet, like when you sort of think about the stories we get, it is absolutely, oh, I, I, I know the uh, Donna Hill, I was just talking about that book actually yesterday. <laughs> um, but there's just been a sort of limiting of the kind of, of stories we tell. Um, and I would love to see um, more Black romances reflect the diaspora connection as well. And can I, as an ancient one, just throw in that that's so many diasporic, African diasporic individuals and subjectivities traveled to the continent of Africa and, and, and stayed and spent time there and so on. And those stories and romances evolved out of that. And those stories need to be told. Sorry, um, I'll shut up now. Um, I, oh, I, guess, I was gonna ask. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, well, for anybody who, uh, uh, in terms of if you've gotten the arc for uh, Black Love Matters, um, or those who haven't or will see it in February, my essay there isn't very um, optimistic or hopeful in terms of Black historical romance. What Nicole said is correct. Um, there are fewer um, Black authors writing historical romance than there were now. Um, uh, back then, or when I started in 2014, I've not, I've stopped doing it. Um, 
it's uh, really, it, it's not been encouraged. <laughs> um, and uh, for this reason, um, I, my, uh, my, my two series were experiments um, and I don't, you know, and along those, that line or in, in terms of whether or not I would call it a success, I, I really, I can't say it, that, that, that it's been successful. Part of my hope, and that's how I end the, uh, the essay, is that it would hope that more people would take up and see, you know, what else there might be as it, the very things that Nicole talks about in terms of writing uh, across the diaspora and the things you're talking about, Margo, in terms of back further in time and all of that other kind of stuff. But I just think a lot of Black authors and see, you know, it's a lot of hard work. And uh, with the exception of you, Margo, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what it is that, that you can produce and you'll produce. But um, there are reasons why we have just like handfuls, just less than two handfuls of people doing it. So, my attack uh, would have been Black historical fiction and the way history and uh, race works in a contemporary setting, uh, the contemporary Milford stories that always existed um, for me in um, front of mine. I just never got to, to get them out there um, and to articulate them. And that um, my current book, Sweet Tea, was a way of dipping a foot or a toe into that contemporary world for Milford albeit with a white guy, but then following that, you know, seeing to bring in um, more Black heroes that um, are contemporary and HBCU space and how that all works. So um, that's, that's been at least in terms of the way I, I see the future. Uh, but, um, and, and to say, you know, a lot of the stuff with the, the billionaire tropes and all it, you know, I, I've always had this sort of niggling feeling about that. Is that a way of keeping more Black people out of romance? You know, the whole aspect with capitalism and economics and how much of that is tied up into uh, romance is always made me uh, very disconcerted. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dick, I had cut you off, Latoya. I thought Piper was going to speak. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 you're fine. Um, I guess, like, from when I started in publishing, um, like almost 20 years ago now to now, I would say that I am excited that some publishers are like really making an effort to explore more Black romance. I will agree that they are almost like dipping their toe in with certain genres that they kind of know how to do well, a la contemporary, which continues to sell well. But when you do talk about historical sci-fi fantasy, romantic suspense, like, I mean, it's like you see like no authors really in this genre. Um, and so what I say is if you have the chops to go indie, you know, and the, these are the stories that you want to tell, maybe do hybrid, you know, a lot of my clients, that's what they're doing. Like there are stories that are important to them that the publishers don't know how to market or are not interested in. And so they will self-publish those stories. And then the stories that are more of a traditional route, they kind of write those stories for that. Um, so, you know, um, and I also think, you know, really pushing them to hire more staff in-house for those traditional um, roles, not just bringing in a ton of authors of color that no one knows what to do with, but really have the editing staff, have the publicity and marketing teams that want to, that, you know, are passionate about those, um, those genres. And then also, I guess I'll challenge some of the authors as well, you know, sometimes, especially when I was an acquisitions editor, there would be projects I loved, but I couldn't really speak to any other comps that did well. So even if they don't feature black characters, but it might be in a space opera world, or it might be in a small town, you know, romance world, et cetera, like, you know, showing them, hey, this will fit the same audience as just Black people, guys. Like, it's not rocket science. Sometimes you really have to break it down like that. You have to be the publicist. You've got to be the marketing person, just like with everything, right? It's always harder for us. We've got to, like, do everybody else's job as well. And sadly, that's the harsh reality sometimes. 
you have to like jump in and 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 make yourself known and if you don't want to be the bad guy you might want to have your agent do that right and start asking questions and challenging them well what are you guys doing well who are you reaching out to and you have to be more hands-on to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do because the reality is a lot of them don't give a shit. So they're just going on what they know. And if they know, okay, this type of book sells, we're going to just do that and just kind of be safe about it. You have to challenge them to say, okay, well, I saw with Joe Schmo, you did this, which is publishing pays me, right? That's what that proved like, hey, well, these folks are doing it. So why not us? And sadly that it's, I think it's going to be like that for a little while to say, hey, you know, until you get these dinosaurs out and kind of bring in the new blood who want to try new things and really find, you know, how to market. Um, I think that's going to be the, the turning point in traditional. Of course, indie, you know, you guys have more control, but definitely for traditional. I definitely agree with what um, Latoya said, particularly about this gatekeeping um, because so much of publishing um, has been white middle-class women kind of at the forefront of those kind of us, you know, trying to get our stories out there and them saying, well, I just can't connect. I just don't understand. Um, so that becomes increasingly frustrated for authors who want to go, perhaps go the traditional route, route. And as she said, maybe that's not for us. Maybe that the idea of or just having to think about maybe doing hybrid is something that's, you know, that could be beneficial for you if you have this story that you want to get out that maybe traditional can't understand. And I think when you presented this question, Margo, about this future of Black romance, you know, at first I said, oh, it's limitless, you know, and things like that. But then I thought about it, I said, let me think critically about how I want to answer this question. And this is a hope and a dream, <laughs> but... I want Black romance to be a place where it's revolutionary and dismantles all these notions of what Blackness is, particularly for men. And I say that because we don't see a lot of men reading romance, particularly Black men. Uh, we don't see a lot of Black men want to even pick up a damn book sometimes. And I hate to say it like that. Um, but I want that to be a space for Black men to want to feel like they're welcome in reading romance and that romance isn't a place that's soft or this, that, and the third. But that also comes with trying to dismantle this idea of toxic masculinity in our community um, and get them to see different ways of how men can be. And I think my hope is that um, we as writers and, and consumers of romance see, hey, you know, try to involve more men or the people who identify as men um, to read romance. Um, and I'd love to see more male authors of romance too, um, as well. They're out there. Um, they might not call themselves romance writers, but they write in romance. It's, 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 it's in there in the fantasy. It's in there in the, you know, middle grades. It's in there, well, not middle, well, YA. It's in there in the, um, you know, the contemporary that they're writing, you know, they they have the romantic elements. They say, "Oh no, no, it's not a romance. This is a this is a you know serious book. No, dude, it's a romance. You know, just be honest with yourself." Um, so I I just would love to see more of that um, in romance and that masculinity look looks and appears so many different ways. And it's okay to be soft. It's okay to be sweet. It's okay to be kind. It's okay to be open you know, being this alpha male is not the only thing that sells um, in books that feature black male protagonists. That's what I hope. Any, before we move to Q and A, um, any comments, thoughts? unconstrained by the three topics that you would like to put out for the audience? I think um, absolutely there needs to be more queer Black romance. I think yes. that is a huge, huge oversight and it is a problem for many different reasons. 
But I think um, in particular, um, I think what we see in sort of that diversifying effort is a sort of general, um, again, refusal to see not just black people, but that's the topic of this panel, but to see people as full and complex human beings. And so when we start erasing black people in particular, uh, queer black people from the contemporary and historical moment, like we're doing, I think, damage. Um, and especially if you consider how much money queer romance makes certain imprints and how much it makes at indie, the fact that there is not just an erasure of queer black people, but sometimes when they're there, it's sort of a perpetuation of various kinds of stereotypes um, and abusive behavior against them. I think we're doing really sort of harmful work as well. And that is allowed, in my opinion, um, to continue because um, we refuse to think about, again, the sort of complicated uh, ways in which people's identities are constructed. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay, I'm gonna second um, Nicole's comment. Um, having, again, I'm often on Twitter, I will follow a, uh, a thread about um, Black queer romance and specifically non-white queer romance. Um, and I think as romance readers, authors, um, Black people, we need to own all of the subjectivities within our communities, not the ones that fit our expectations, not the one that align themselves with the way in which we might have been brought up theologically, um, the way in which we have been brought up in terms of our socioeconomic class. Uh, There's so many factors that we always need to consider that I think this panel has raised at least for us to think about in terms of how Black romance is not a linear, um, structure. It's not a monolithic structure. It is not, I'm going to even, I'm going to remove the word diverse from our conversation when we talk about Black romance, but that it is multi-layered, multifaceted, and always, always rich in the subtleties in which Black romance can be represented. Um, I want, before we turn it over to the Q&A, and I've been going through this trying to figure out what questions to pull out, because there are a lot of statements that I would have to figure out how to turn them into a question. Um, I wanted to speak to the historical romance. I'm a historical romance author. I submitted to traditional presses a historical romance featuring um, um, Black romance set in the 17th century. Um, every editor wanted me to make it interracial or wanted me to move it to Regency and Victorian. Okay. So I need to put that out there to y'all folks in traditional um, circles that you need to stop because you're perpetuating a system that you swear you want to correct, you want to change. All right. So just stop. If an author comes to you with a historical romance with Black characters, Black romance set in 15th century Italy, Take a look at it. There aren't cops. And, and Latoya, I do have to say that sometimes there aren't cops because people aren't writing that because they're writing to market. And so you may miss something exciting in terms of black romance that is not set there. I, I just needed to, to say that as an academic who writes about this stuff, this I'd like to see more of. Um, I also believe that every panelist on, on here has spoken eloquently to 
what needs to happen in this industry from the point of Rex, submissions, storylines, who's included, who's excluded, because even within our own subgenre, we exclude. Um, and I want to thank all of you for basically raising to the for some of the problems, but also some of the potential solutions for a future within Black romance. Uh, I'm going to ignore any reference to Bridgerton because I have very decided opinions on there and we don't on that particular phenomenon and we don't have enough time. So I'm trying to look for questions. Oh, Oh, I think I may see one. So with your permission, um, panelists, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, but first I'm gonna ask, do you have questions of any of the other panelists? Okay. Uh, okay, so the first question um, comes from someone who says, I'm not an expert in black romance and in romance in general. Um, because if I will ask a Margo, oh, okay, let me, how in Black romance, um, how in Black romance can we express the history? Okay, I, I'm going to paraphrase this question. I want to ask you how in Black romance can we express the history, traditions, and daily life of African Americans and other parts of Af African diaspora? I think that's the question. Um, I'm going to put it out there to the panelists, um, cause I actually am doing a class tomorrow and I'm going to talk a lot about this stuff. So I'm not going to add my opinions to any of theirs. Um, so anyone who wants to take this question, um, and it's just about the representation of traditions and daily life of Afro-Americans and other members of the African diaspora. And maybe even think about the way in which um, we think about African-American, um, both hyphenated and not, but the, the diasporic communities that abound within different continents um, who are of African descent. So I think the question has to do with, with representation of diasporic traditions in communities, if I got the question right. <laughs> I wanted to ask the uh, person who was asking that, how much um, Black romance have they read? Okay. Um, it was interesting. It's The person said I'm not an expert and in romance in general. So I'm assuming they're not familiar. Yeah, that's, that would be my presumption as well. So I, okay. I think um, my answer to that would be to read the Black Romance. Okay. Um, uh, okay, there are, there are several direct uh, do you mind if I, uh, Margaret, will quick take up um, what Barbara was asking about Black inspirational? Yeah. Well, yes. I saw her so asking pretty. that more. And I know something that we've talked about. Um, and she also, at one point, brought up um, Tony Shiloh. Um, is it or definitely pre pandemic? How our, our lives are going to be thought of now? <laughs> was, that, was that something that happened before the pandemic? Was that something happened? This was before, because I know, because I was the only spot in a room of about 80 other white folks. Um, and the panel in Nashville was about the future of inspirational romance. I took it upon myself to drive up to Nashville uh, four hours away here in Atlanta to attend this, uh, this meeting, whereupon one of the representatives from one of the uh, entrenched uh, inspirational um, uh, publishers uh, took it upon because they were they were asking somebody asked what's going to happen in the next ten years. She got up and she took it upon herself in a very quivering voice to say, "We have to begin to see our black brothers and sisters 
uh, as human beings and blah, blah, blah. And there was not a pin, you could hear a pin drop room except me clapping and cheering. And see, this was definitely before pandemic, definitely before George Floyd, because I was unafraid to clap and cheer <laughs> when she said that. Um, that thing, but ever since that, which I believe it happened in 2017, uh, her publisher took on Tony Shiloh to publish her contemporary that is coming up, but it's the publisher that in all of the surveys of, of romance or whatever, where you see they've always Bethany, where they've seen, you've seen they publish zero uh, in the way of diverse books or whatever. So they finally took the leap here in 2021 and pick out one black author that they could see fit to publish. And all I have to say, Barbara, is watch that book because you know they're going to use it as their excuse or whatever to your justification or whatever. So I, I don't know what happened to that young woman. I hope she's still working for them. <laughs> She was very nice. And I got, I took it upon myself afterwards to go up to her and say, listen, I'm glad you said it because it needed to be said. So even if all the other folk in here were shocked, um, yeah, I'm glad that you said it. Um, yeah, so I, I, that that's all I have to say is, is Barbara, is watch that book because if they can see they can make green off of us, then they'll be all in and they may be all in to the point where they're going to get some of their folk to write it or whatever. But there is a whole large community of um, Black uh, indie uh, inspirational authors, as you well know, who have been knocking on that door for years and it has not been opened until this year. The other ones in the, the Harlequin line, they had their one and now this year they picked up two more, yay. I mean, you know, all of these like single digit numbers that we can still get on two hands, that ain't it. I'm sorry, but it's not, that's not it. So, and it's like Carol saying, certain quarters of inspirational romance, Peter audience, that's exactly it, Carol. That's what it is. They're looking for comfort in that audience. And the only other aspect that's gonna change that or stop is if they see major bank happening, that's it. Um, there are some amazing questions in that are in direct messages. Um, and so I think I'll go through and I'll ask, um, and this has to do with, um, tropes. Um, by the way, I usually as, and this just comes from my academic background, when I'm calling out questions, I don't, um, I usually don't name people. And the reason for it is, is uh, it creates a kind of hierarchy or privilege. And so I'll ask the question. Um, so I'm gonna apologize to anyone who feels slighted in any way up front, but this is a practice that comes with me from academia. Um, the question is how much of this, and, I'm just, and, we were, and it has to do with tropes and conventions and romance. How much of this is about the way popular tropes and the HEA are traditionally constructed around whiteness and white patriarchal capitalist fantasies? I think Piper touched on that earlier when she was saying that, um, you know, there's this element of capitalism um, in the stories that you know, to, in order to have a happy ending, you have to be rich, you have to be successful, you have to be, uh, you know, straight male, and some most of the time is white. Um, so that creates this weird, you know, sense of, well, you know, black folks can't be any of those things. So, you know, happily ever afters aren't afforded to us. Um, and that's frustrating. Um, and then, on the flip side of that, I would say, absolutely yes, happily ever after are afforded to us. And they can look like that. They can look, they can be in that model of billionaire capitalist, but they can also look a different way. And on the other side, as, as my, I know my podcast partner is here, but we talked about it on the podcast, 
um, sometimes it's not about a happily ever after. Sometimes it's about a happily for now. Um, sometimes it's about, um, you know, what does that look like? It, for example, I'm over 40 and I'm already established in my life and my career and everything. Maybe the, the fairy tale romance thing is not for me. Maybe I just want to be happy and have a sense of satisfaction and partnership for now that doesn't exactly include the traditional marriage, the traditional um, quote unquote accepted way that a happily ever after should look like. Um, so, you know, it, 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 so again, she, as Piper said, it's so, so much of it is wrapped up in what people think conventional happily ever after should look like. And it, there is that capitalist white male patriarchal hegemonic strain that's, that's there that increasingly frustrating. And as a reader who may not want to see that all the time, who may want to see a twist in that, you know, sometimes it's hard to find those books that are like that. But you can find them when you look, they're there. <laughs> I think there's also an issue though of like, romance literacy, because I do think actually a number of uh, Black romance authors have been writing HEAs that look nothing like exactly what Piper is talking about. The problem, though, is as she said about her own work, that then the response to that is negative. Or I think um, there's a sort of uh, kind of conversation that completely gets missed when people don't realize the really sort of subversive work they're doing. So I think about like the number of uh, Beverly Jenkins books that end right at the beginning of building a community. I think about the number of Alyssa Cole's books that end right at the beginning of the next phase of activism, the number of uh, Rebecca Weatherspoon books that end right at the, again, finding of a home. Like those are actually really significant departures from how we tend to imagine the HEA. And yet, what happens is that we never have a conversation about, and those are just recent examples, right? Like, I mean, you could go back and look at authors who were writing 20 years ago and have the same kind of conversation about how they were either subverting or just throwing away that sort of capitalist white sort of patriarchal narrative of an HEA. But part of the problem is that um, so many readers, um, don't care <laughs> or don't even have the sort of cultural capacity to understand what they're doing, right? So um, there is, um, I think on the one hand, we absolutely should, sort of should deal with the reality that um, the HEA as the, I wanna be really sort of careful how I sort of frame this community here, right? Um, and I'm gonna, I. So I would use Romance Landia personally to identify a largely white readership and authorship. And that's how I use it. That HEA definition, I think, fits in that space. I don't necessarily think that that's true for a community of largely Black authors of romance. Their HEAs are much more complicated and um, can be much more diverse. But I think what we're seeing in particular um, is that to write in traditional, you either have to conform to that sort of white centered HEA, or you have to write so subtly that the sort of uh, the changes you are making can so easily be overlooked. And that I think is frustrating, or you have to just decide not to work in that in the traditional space um, so that you can do what you want to do. Um, so, yeah. I definitely think this goes back, Margo, to what you were saying earlier about your frustration with comps. And yes, the reality of it is that there aren't a whole lot. And so that's when you have to kind of get a little um, creative sometimes. And again, it really will boil down to that editor or agent that you get to help you kind of navigate these spaces because, you know, if you have a publisher that's willing to take a chance and say, you know what? screw it, we're gonna, we gonna start here because we know the romance reader likes this and then we'll see what happens. The sad reality is there aren't a ton of them that are gonna take a chance on black romance with, you know, that kind of breaks 
the mold, but they'll do that for white authors. They'll take a chance the whole, all the time and figure it out, right? But when it comes to us, oh, it doesn't sell well. You know, that was my biggest challenge. There were so many authors I wanted to work with, but what are the numbers? Okay, well, if we look at it in for this genre, you know, or for this market of authors, here's what it is, then all day, yeah, bye, bye, bye. But they're not looking in that lens. They're comparing it to what their mainstream authors do, which have all the backing, have all the marketing. And then they say, well, look, see, it didn't work. You know, and then they use that as a reason to block other acquisitions because they didn't really try. You know, it was like they used uh, their lens, which obviously is not the same as ours, and they tried to make kind of like fitting a square into a circle. So I think, you know, it, 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 it just depends on you as the author, you know, how much you can stand, honestly, because even in house as an editor, that's why I left traditional like corporate publishing because I just kept hitting a wall and you get to a point where you're like all right fuck this <laughs> like you know for my sanity I have to walk away but you know um you know it really just again depends on you know what you want to do and what you want to say and how much you are gonna keep hitting it until you find that person that or that publisher that's gonna do what needs to be done for your books yeah, I'll just jump in and say, like, um, Latoya, who was my editor, um, I think it was when you ran into a certain thing with the Virtuous Ruby and how that particular book had come across uh, in terms of the way that it ended, you know, and that your largely white audience is like, oh, why did they run away at the end? No, this was the beginning of the great migration, right? This, sort of, this whole aspect in terms of this Black, young Black couple taking themselves, their labor, their talent, et cetera away from the South that insisted on persecuting them. They were not running away. So this is the kind of thing you run into in terms of traditional publishing and their expectations. Um, and the Don't Talk to Margaret, a large part of it is also the history wars that now have amped up more than they had six, seven, eight years ago. The whole thing with, you know, how they per perceive of CRT and all of that that I think is gonna be even more of an issue now in terms of talking about black people and how they lived and loved and persisted and resilient in the time period that you're writing from. Yeah, it's exhausting. <laughs> um, we've got about eight minutes. Um, I think a lot, of, and I've been scrolling through the chat and a lot of what I could gather were questions have been answered. Um, before I turn it over to Julie, I just want to say that I am so, so, so grateful to all of you panelists, all of you attendees for taking the time on a Friday to focus on black romance. Um, I don't think we have, we, we don't have answers um, because we can't predict the future. Um, we can just try to lay the path for it. Uh, I'm gonna ask each of, before I give it over to Julie, ask each of the panelists to lay a stone on the path to black romance future that they want to see. And I don't want any pessimism. I don't want any negativity. I want you to power through all that ancestral blackness that have kept us surviving in this country, on the continent of Africa, in the face of imperialism, in the face of white supremacy. I want you to lay a stone. Okay, and this is the privilege of being an ancient. That's all I'm gonna say. This is a privilege of me being an agent. So I'm gonna ask you to lay a stone and I'll start with you, Tati. Um, well, that's overwhelming. Um, I don't know, my, my hope and my, my hope for black romance is that we'll stop being pigeonholed as just black romance and that people will see that our stories are universal too. Um, and that uh, 
Black romance is culturally rich and beautiful and inspiring. And it's so many things wrapped up in one that I can't even describe it in one in one sentence effectively, like I'm rambling right now. Um, so I'm just grateful to be part of the community, even on the periphery right now. Um, so that's all I want to say. Latoya? Um, I would say that right now I'm working really hard to try and place a lot of my Black romance clients at various traditional publishers. I've had some success and some challenges as well, but I want to continue to do that. Um, and also uh, Black women's fiction. I know that, you know, this conversation is mostly about romance, but I do think there are HEAs in women's fiction. And I think there is a bit of a crossover there. Um, and I'm noticing that some of the spaces I can't quite navigate in romance, I've been able to move into trade paperback original and in some cases hardcover. So I'm really looking forward to doing more of that and also um, getting our books in audio. Uh, more and more. I think that is an untapped space. And for someone like me who reads for a living, I don't always get to read for pleasure. So audiobooks are my go-to to kind of like stay abreast of what's going on. And so that's a market where I've been making quite a few sales for Black romance authors. So I'm hoping to continue to do that. Piper? Yeah, it's hard. Um, hopefully that there will be a um, a larger embrace of the variety that exists in black women. which I love, different companies, different approaches, different numbers in terms of Blackness that really reflect um, the depth of our Um, yeah, no, I agree with Piper. I, I said all day, this is hard. Um, I, I think, um, yikes. I think I'll ask for things I just want to, I want more of to read. I want, um, I want more Black queer romance straight up. Um, and I don't want it to be siloed, um, nor do I want it to cater to the white gaze. Um, I want more Black historical romance. Um, and from all time periods and all over the world. Um, I want more, um, I, I want more black, in particular black women who buck conventions historically. I'm not interested in personally, I'm not interested in sort of respectful society women. I want more black sex workers, they exist. I want um, more sassy blues singers. Like I want like queer and polyamorous black women. I just want the full range of blackness that we all know exist. And I want, um, if I could say anything for black authors, I, I in particular um, want them to stop looking to white people for um, confirmation that they are good enough. I'm going to turn it over to Julie. Um, again, I want to thank everyone um, for being here. And I especially want to thank our panelists and um, Piper, Nicole, um, have essays forthcoming in the special edition of um, the JPRS Black Romance issue. I think it's coming out next year. And they are fabulous. They are just amazing essays. So. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Tati. Thank you, Latoya. Thank you, Piper. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Yaki, who couldn't be here. I would love to have heard what, what um, they have to say. 
And thank you for Julie. Thank you to Julie most of all for involving this old Black Shakespearean <laughs> and all of this. All right. It's my pleasure. Thanks to all of you, Margot, Nicole, Latoya, Tatiana, Piper, and Yaki, uh, who again couldn't be here but really wanted to be here. Thanks so much to Eric Selinger and to Amy Burge uh, for co-organizing. And I just want to invite you to attend uh, Margo Hendricks masterclass at 10 a.m. tomorrow. It was full at 50, but she has gracefully um, told us that we can open it up to 150. So the Eventbrite link is in the chat. Thanks to all of you for attending. Have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Bye. <laughs>